for the women's session, we have Dr. Latricia Hall. She is a physician at the Arkansas Health Education Center that's off of Mulberry next to the hospital. So once, here goes Dr. Hall. So what we're going to go over today, we're going to go over the general things that affect mainly females. And then we're going to go over things that affect everybody, but things that I want y'all to keep in mind and work on so you can be healthy women. Um, first, we're going to go over pap smears, um, then mammograms, then we're going to go through the colon cancer, heart disease, the diabetes, osteoporosis, and then at the end, we're going to go to my favorite section, which is uh, working on your healthy diet and exercise. Okay. So, um, as far as statistics go, the number one killer of women, and this includes men too, this is about the same for the men too, the number one killer is going to be heart disease. That's going to include your heart attacks, your strokes, your coronary artery disease, and your congestive heart failure. The number two is going to include your cancers. That's the number two killer of all women. And beneath that, you have three different cancers that are at the top. The first one is going to be your lung cancer. Second is going to be your breast cancer. Then the third is your colorectal or colon cancer or rectal cancer. And number three is going to be stroke. So of course, today we're going to hit on how can you prevent getting heart disease, the cancers, and the strokes. So the very first thing I want to talk about is the pap smears. All of us have to do it. We dread it every time we go but it's something we need to do. Um, the recommendations have changed within the last few years. When I was growing up, it was three years after you became sexually active at, what, at whatever age that was. They recommend now that you start at age 21 and you get an annual pap smear every year. Um, at the age, uh, starting at age 30, if you haven't had any bad pap, so if they haven't, if your doctor hasn't told you that you had dysplasia on your pap smear or had to do colonoscopies or uh, frog therapy or anything like that, you can move to every three years. The other thing, if you're not HIV positive or uh, have a weakened immune system for any reason, you can move to three years. Now. Every doctor is different, so I have to tell you that your doctor might say, no, I want you here every year. And the main reason they're going to say this, I'm going to tell y'all the secret, is because us as women, if we're not going for a pap smear, we don't go to the doctor. So if that's what we have to tell y'all to get y'all to come see us every year, that's what we usually do. So that's the secret. But it's mainly so the point of that is even though you don't have a pap smear make sure you're going to see your doctor regularly because there's other things that come up that you need to have checked now after the age 60 65 and this is very controversial whether or not you can stop your pap smears and it's going to be different it's going to be up to your doctor for my patients i usually tell them about 65 that's the day that you start jumping up for joy because you can stop your pap smears and that's only if you have had normal PAPs for 10 years. Now, if you, for some reason, had cervical cancer, then that's a different story. We're going to have to continue for a little bit longer. But at age 65 is when I usually say, OK, let's kind of cut that out of your exam, and you'll be happy. And then we go from there. Now, the reason that we do pap smears, of course, is to look for cervical cancer. So I'm sure. I don't think we have anybody in here that's under 21. So I'm thinking everybody has had a pap smear, so you already know. You get up in cells, we do the speculum exam, we do the brush to get a little bit of your cells off your cervix, and then we do the bimanual exam to feel for your ovaries and make sure that they're not big and you're not having any tenderness. Um, for cervical cancer, the number one cause of cervical cancer is HPV, human papilloma virus. Um, it's very important to get this because even though the uh, statistics of or the occurrence of cervical cancer has decreased over the years, it's still very common. So according to on the internet, of course, is 30 are diagnosed a day, 11 die a day. So we definitely want to keep doing your pap smears. 
Now, human papillomavirus, if y'all not familiar with it, it is a virus that is sexually transmitted. It's the most common sexually transmitted disease. And it's one of those that you get just from general genital contact. So you can get it even if you were a condom. That's why it's something that you need to make sure that you do protect yourself and you get checked. Now, they do have a vaccine out now that's called the Gardasil. And if you are between the ages 9 and 26, or you have children that are between those ages, and this is female and males, I recommend that you do get this, because it is something that's cutting down on the risk of cervical cancer. And a lot of my um, young men that come to me in clinic, I know the moms or the parents are kind of reluctant to give them that too, but if you think about it, if it's a sexually transmitted disease, Females have to get it from somewhere. So if we are going to try to decrease it, we need to hit it up on both sides. So it is important for the males and the females to get it. There are three injections. They don't feel the, the best. They do hurt a little bit worse than the others because I have had it. But it is something that is important to get. Question. Mm -hmm. Why not beyond age 26? Um, they don't... Usually, they've only tested from 9 to 26, and beyond 26, they're saying that it's really not, um, I don't think they've done enough testing on it. And by that age, usually, you've already, if you're going to get it, you've already had it. So, they recommend, they're trying to get the ages where slightly before they start becoming sexually active, and the, air, the ages where you're mostly sexually active or you're more, um, what's a good word for it? Yes. <laughs> there you go. So they do say stop at 26. Okay, next one is for mammograms. Um, I haven't had this yet, so I haven't had, went through this, but of course my mom tells me she hates them. She dreads it every year. According to her, she goes and she sits in front of a machine and they squeeze your breast and it hurts. Hopefully one day they will come up with a better way, but for now that is the only way to check for breast cancer. So the recommendation for this again has changed, just like the past years, it used to be starting at 50 now they're moving it back at age 40. What they learned is that between age 40 and 50, breast cancer, um, the rate of spreading um, is faster between those ages. So they want to find it before it gets really bad. So the recommendation now is to start at age 40 and have it annually. Now this might be different when you go to your doctors because this is something that's been within the last year or two. But um, the other thing that's controversial again is the age where you stop mammograms. For they say around 70 or older you can stop or you can stop when um, your doctor look at you and say okay if you're gonna if your life expectancy is less than 10 years then you can stop. I go by that. So if I have a woman that comes in to see me that's 70 and she's more active than me and she's smaller than me and she has no health problems, I already know this woman is probably going to live to she to 100. So I'm probably going to say you probably still need to keep doing mammograms. I just don't want to tell them to stop and then a few years later she ends up with, with breast cancer. So the um, risk outweighs the benefits. So, um, and the other thing that's very important for you to realize, a lot of people think that, okay, I don't have breast cancer in my family, and they think that they're safe. But the thing about it is that 85% of women that are diagnosed with breast cancer each year do not have a family history. So please don't, if that's one thing that you take out of this presentation today, Please know that even if you don't have breast cancer in your family, you still need to get your annual mammograms. And you could still have breast cancer, get breast cancer. So breast cancer is the second most common. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
The thing about it is that they, through all their research, this all goes back to research, and I hate to say it all goes back to what's proven in research and what your insurance will pay for. I hate to say that, but it is, that's the way it is. Now, the thing that they don't want to do is have mammograms earlier and then you end up having to get biopsies and um, uh, surgeries for something that's benign. So they're trying to cut down on having those negative results and causing too much anxiety in the patients that are younger. Now, if you have a family, which I was going to get to, if you have a family history, you want to go 10 years before the youngest age of the person who was diagnosed with cancer. So if they were diagnosed at 50, you want to get your mammogram at 40. If they were diagnosed at 40, you need to get a mammogram at 30. And if they do see something, then you're going to have more um, annual visits or follow-ups with ultrasound or biopsies. So um, again, this is the second most common cancer um, right under lung cancer, and that's both men and women. Um, do remember that men can have breast cancer. It's not just a woman only. And the statistics is that Caucasian women is more common, but in um, African-American women, we tend to die more from it. And I believe that's from that we don't follow up quick enough. We tend to sit there and ignore it or try not to focus on it. And it's really sad to see that. And it's, I've seen it a few times. I've only been here a year and a half, and I've seen at least two women like that, where they come in in stage breast cancer and that was their first time coming to the ER. And they just didn't want to come. But they knew that that's probably what it was. Okay, so the things you want to look for that makes you think breast cancer that you need to be going to your doctor. If you feel a lump in your breast, definitely go in and say, hey, I have something right here, I need you to feel it. If your nipple starts to invert, so if you're, you have a regular nipple that kind of sticks out and all of a sudden you see that it's starting to grow in, that's something you should be worried about. Um, if you start to do dimpling, so if you put your arms, get in front of the mirror, and you put your arms and do this, and you start to see dimples, that's not supposed to be there, so you need to come in. If you start to have dripping, and this can be blood, mucus, milk, that's if you're not pregnant, those, your nipples shouldn't be dripping. So we need to see that too. If you're starting to see any redness or rash or pain on your breasts, that should lower me. And lastly, skin changes. There's one breast cancer that makes your breast look like an orange peel. So if you start to see that your skin is becoming rubbery or hard or something like that, that's something we need to be looking at and getting a mammogram or biopsies or something. Okay, next one. Um, it seems like I'm going through all the things that y'all don't like to get, so. Hopefully y'all getting the point. <laughs> so the next thing is colonoscopy. And I can actually speak from experience. I've had a colonoscopy. It's not that bad. The worst part about it is that the day before you can't eat. You pretty much do clear liquids and you drink a medicine to clean you out. So you might be on the toilet after 12 on out. But <laughs> The next day, you go in early, you get your colonoscopy, you wake up feeling good, and you go eat. So the worst part is the day before. So it's not something you should avoid. So, thank you. <laughs> I was afraid to uh, move it. Uh-huh, go ahead. What is your take on the virtual colonoscopy mm -hmm. versus the regular? Okay. I actually did look it up last night. <laughs> because I figured that was going to come up. And from what it's saying, that is something that's actually new, and they're doing more CTs or um, CTs to look at your colon. The only is good because it's not as um, uncomfortable, and you don't have to do the fasting and the stuff before. But the bad thing about it, if they do see a polyp, you still have to get a colonoscopy anyway to go in and 
clip it out and take it out. And CTs will not see the little ones, the little bitty ones that are called, that you'll see on the colonoscopy. So, and the other part about it is more pricier and it's not offered everywhere. So maybe if they work on it more and more and perfect it more, then it might be the thing in the next 10 years or so. But right now it's something new and I'm not sure, I haven't heard of anybody actually doing it in Pine Bluff. I'm sure they probably do it in Little Rock. They seem to do everything in Little Rock, so. <laughs> but um, as far as the colonoscopy, um, what your doctor will do, or the GI doc, or any other surgeons, they go in with the scope, look through your colon, and they look for little growths on your wall. And they also look for hemorrhoids, they look to see if you have diverticuli, which are little outpouching that can cause pain and infection later on. So they're not looking just for colon cancer, they're looking for a little bit, your whole colon health. Um, so if they see a polyp, they're gonna go in, they're gonna cut it out or burn it out or say, okay, this person, if they find something big, they're gonna say, okay, you need to have surgery, we need to cut this part of your colon out. Um, as you can see on the picture, it goes through your entire uh, large intestines all the way down to right uh, ileocecal where your appendix is. Um, I'm not, I haven't seen too many people actually get the sigmoidoscopy in my head. If you're going to go in there, might as well do the whole thing. Why stop at that area if y'all can see where the green is? You might as well see the whole colon at, in one shoot. So the recommendation now is you start getting colonoscopies at age 50. And if your first colonoscopy is normal, then you repeat it within seven to 10 years. Um, surgeons are, I think they're still seeing 10, the GI doctors are seeing seven. So I have a feeling it's about to start going sooner than the 10 years. Now if they do see a polyp, then they're probably gonna have you come back quicker, probably within five years. Now, same with breast cancer. If you have a family history, you gotta go in early. Or if you have inflammatory bowel disease, which is Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, you have to go in earlier. So, same with the other one. If you have a family member that was diagnosed at 50, you need to get a colonoscopy at 40. If you have a lot of family members, you might wanna go even a little bit earlier and then have repeats maybe every five years instead. But just go by whatever your surgeon or your GI doc um, recommends. So colon cancer is the third most common cancer. The things that you want to look for just with the breast cancer, there are some signs. Unfortunately, when you start to see signs, it's the colon cancer is spreading more than we would like it to be. But these are things that you definitely want to look for. So if you're having any rectal bleeding or bleeding with stool, let your doctor know. If you're having changes in your bowel movements, so you know you have good bowel movements all the time, and all of a sudden you go straight to diarrhea every day or constipation every day. We need to know about that to see what's going on. It could be something as simple as um, your thyroid is messed up or you have a virus or something like that but we would never want to overlook it when you might need a colonoscopy. If you have persistent um, abdominal discomfort and fatigue and anytime you have unexplained weight loss, go to your doctor. That's the common thing that we look for with any type of cancer. If a person comes in and say, well, I've lost like 30 pounds in the last year and I'm eating the same, and they might say, well, I just look good. And I was like, no, something is going on. <laughs> I was like, you don't just lose weight and not be exercising and eating the same. Something is going on. So anytime you see that, we need to be looking for not just colon cancer, but any type of cancer. OK, so the next one is heart disease. That's the number one killer of men and women in the US. And this has increased over the years um, at the same time as obesity has increased. So this is something that we really have to get a hold of. And heart disease includes coronary artery disease, which is where you go in, you have blockages around your hearts or in your legs and you have to get sense. Um, you have heart attacks, 
uh, congestive heart failure, which is where your heart kind of, just like any muscle, if you work it too hard, it either starts to build up and can't contract as much or it's too weak. So you end up having fluid that flush your lungs and in your um, legs and you have problems breathing and fatigue and shortness of breath with exertion. And the last one is stroke. Okay, so the first thing is atherosclerosis, which is the clogging of the arteries, and that's due to fat accumulation in the wall. So if you look at the little picture, so the top one on the left is your normal artery, and you start to have, um, as you grow older, which I can tell you almost everybody in here has this going on somewhere in your body, is when it gets to the point where it blocks off your artery is where, it's in, where you're in trouble. So you're eating fatty foods, you're eating your fast food and your pork and everything like that, and you have high cholesterol, and you put your high blood pressure on top of it, and you're forcing it into your walls, and then you have diabetes on top, you end up having these arteries that can't get any blood going through. So you end up with heart attacks, strokes, um, problems in your legs, you can end up with amputations because you don't have good blood supply. A lot of pain goes with this also. I thought I saw a hand, okay. So, so the number one way is gonna be making sure you're of a good weight, make sure you exercise, and smoking, which we're gonna get to a little bit later too. Um, stop smoking and control your diabetes. Okay, so heart attack. The bad thing about being a woman is that we don't, our body doesn't work quite like everybody else's, okay? So when you see the signs on TV where they say, oh, you're gonna have crushing chest pain and you're gonna look like this when you're gonna have a heart attack, the pain is gonna radiate down your left arm into your jaw, shortness of breath, you're gonna be sweating, throwing up, fall to the ground. You know, they go through this exaggeration. That's not how ours look. And it, the sad part about it is that these symptoms are very common and that we can easily overlook it. So for us, we need to look for a shortness of breath. If we start having just pressure or pain, and our pain can be a little bit everywhere. And this goes along with diabetes too, because your nerves are a little bit um, damaged so you don't feel pain um, how you used to. So you can have pain in your lower chest and your upper abdomen. Um, you'll complain of dizziness, lightheadedness or fainting, uh, upper back pressure, and extreme fatigue. So that kind of sounds like a general day, doesn't it? <laughs> and it's kind of hard to know when it is something bad and when it's something that's okay. And that's when you, if you're really concerned about it, go into your doctor, at least let them run, get an EKG or run blood work to make sure that that's not what's going on. So if one of y'all were to come into the ER and you were saying, well, I'm just feeling really tired and I can't walk from down those stairs without being short of breath and I could do that two weeks ago, I'm gonna be running and making sure that you, not, you didn't have a heart attack or you're not having an active heart attack now. So it's really important that you pay attention to your body and try not to overlook things that's going on. Because as women, we're made to deal with pain. That's just how we're made. So we gotta, we gotta know when it is that we need to pay attention to our bodies and go in to your doctor. Okay, so stroke. Has anybody in here seen somebody have a stroke by a show of hands? It's scary, isn't it? So you have a person that's sitting there normal, then all of a sudden their speech is slurred, their face can be drooping, they can't move one side of their body, they might have failed because they can't walk anymore, or you actually walk in on them and they're just there and they can't move, or they're not really responding. It's a really frightening thing, but it's something that re it requires immediate response. This is something that we have to get what we call our clock lockers in, so we can maybe get some of that function back. Other thing is a headache also. So in this picture, you'll see the facial droop, which is actually on, she is smiling, so it's on the left side of her face. 
And a lot of times you won't be able to close your eyes. Um, your left side of your mouth will droop. They'll have slurred speech. They'll try to communicate with you, but you can't understand them or they can't understand you. So it is something, if you see any of these signs or you feel, if you're actually the one that's having a stroke, if you can get to the hospital, do it. But hopefully somebody is around you that they can get, to, get you to the hospital um, fast. And of course, the uh, number one cause of that is atherosclerosis, uh, uh, high cholesterol, the high blood pressure, um, increases your chances of stroke and smoking. Okay, oops, wrong way. So prevention. First on the list is smoking cessation. If you do smoke, it's something that back in the, I guess when it first came out, they didn't, they didn't know how bad um, smoking was, but now it has been shown to cause some of everything. It increases your chances of like any type of cancer, any type of heart problems, stroke. It's just not a good thing to do. And I think we have some young people in here, but hopefully y'all don't do this. If y'all do, I'm going to tell you so you can tell your relatives, especially in African American um, families. The thing that you see everybody smoke are black and mouth our cigars. Please tell them that that's one cigar is like smoking three cigarettes. So a lot of people will say, well, I stopped smoking cigarettes, so I'm smoking the black like maybe once or twice a day. And I'm like, well, that's just worse. So please spread that to your families. That's something that they need to tell a lot of the men to over there. But smoking is not your best friend. If you can give it up, please do. And there are a lot of different ways to try to stop smoking. And there are different ways that your doctor can help you stop if you do need that help. The second thing is to exercise. They do recommend 30 minutes a day. You want to limit your salt to six grams a day or less. Um, you want your BMI, which I'm going to go over later, to be between 18.5 and 24.9. You want your blood pressure to be below 140 over 90 and your cholesterol to be LDL under 160, HDL over, one, over 50, triglycerides under 150, diabetes, hemoglobin A1C under seven. I know that was just a blur. I probably didn't know what I was talking about. So I'm gonna go through a lot of that stuff. Okay, so high blood pressure. So most of our families, this runs in our family. And this is one that is genetic. Um, who in here actually monitors their blood pressure at home or stops by the drugstore and sits down and take their blood pressure? So that's good. So do y'all know what your, I think it has a little, if you're going to a drugstore, it has a little chart that says what you need to be aware of. The blood pressure, and they're getting stricter on what they want your blood pressure to be. So they want it under 120 over 80. They, they are calling prehypertension 120 over 30 on the top to end or or 80 to 89 on the bottom. So if you are in between this um, range, that's when we usually tell you, okay, let's get, let's start exercising, let's lose some weight, let's change your diet. Now, if you go to 140 over 59 on top, and or or, so it can be either or or both, 90 over 99 on bottom, then we're going to tell you, let's start you on the blood pressure medicine. We usually start with a simple diuretic. It might make you go to the bathroom, but it's pretty harmless. Um, then we go, it's a long list of different medications we can put you on, and everybody is different. And we have to take into account, are you diabetic? Do you have kidney disease? Do you, have you had a heart attack already? But it is something that you do have to monitor and keep under. The rate that you want to keep it under is 140 over 80 if you are on blood pressure medication. Um, if you have diabetes, you want it under 130 over 80. And that, this is just to decrease your chances of stroke, heart attack, um, congestive heart failure, and all of that. Now, if you're having, uh, if you go check your blood pressure, and it is 180 over 110, and you are having a heart, um, chest pain, 
headache, dizziness, any of those things, you need to be in the ER. That means that your blood pressure is too high and you are reaching that stroke level. During that time, we need to get your blood pressure down or either calm you down. A lot of us get upset and get angry and then our blood pressure goes sky high. Then we end up in the ER. That's the last thing we want. So if you are notice that your blood pressure is like that or you're, you feel like, okay, you have this thriving headache, you might want to check your blood pressure and make sure that it's not too high. And if it is, come to the ER or your doctor's office, preferably the ER, so we can get it down. Okay, high cholesterol. So your cholesterol comes from a lot of the foods that you eat. So a lot of the red meats, your cheeses, your whole milk, um, a lot of things that's your fatty and things like that that you eat. So your total cholesterol, they used to focus on, well, we want your total cholesterol less than 200. They're still saying that, but they're focusing more on your LDL and the HDL. So I think they're saying more about this on TV now, the LDL and HDL. So the LDL is so your part of your cholesterol you want to be low. So that's the one that if it's too high, it's gonna make you have the fat in your arteries and clog them up and all of that good stuff. You want that number under 100. The HDL is the part of your cholesterol you want to be high. And for women, um, we need that over 50. For men, they kind of looked up and it's under 40. So, but for women, it needs to be over 50. And your triglycerides, which are your fats that you eat, um, is under 150. So when your doctor tells you to come in fasting, this is the main test that they're trying to get accurate. If you come in and you've eaten bef before this, this will be inaccurate and they can't really treat you the way that you need to be treated. Okay. Okay, diabetes. So, this is another one that especially is very common. It is hereditary, but it's something that type 2 is preventable. So, you have your prediabetes, which is your high normals, but not high enough. That's the time where you kind of say, okay, this is time we need to lose weight, we need to exercise, we need to eat better. You have your gestational diabetes, which you have during your pregnancy which actually increases your chances of having type 2 diabetes. Then you have your type 1, which we usually say we're in young people, but it actually can happen in older people also. It's not hereditary. It's usually secondary to some type of autoimmune. So your body starts to attack your pancreas, and all of a sudden you don't have a pancreas to um, break down your sugar, so your sugar stay too high. Um, type 2 is the one that's on the rise. And it's used, it used to be in older people. You would think over age 50 or over age 60 and you're getting diabetes. Now we're starting to see a huge rise in our children. And of course, it's due to them being overweight also. So this is the one that's actually preventable if you do the exercise, a healthier diet, and the weight loss, keeping it at a good weight. So the symptoms that you want to look for in diabetes, if you're having increased thirst and frequency of urination. So you start to realize that every time you look up, you're drinking water. Not because it's hot outside, just because you just got to have it and you just keep going to the bathroom. That could be a sign that you are either pre-diabetic or you, you have diabetes. If you have extreme hunger, which is kind of hard to say that because everybody has extreme hunger sometimes. Um, this is another one that unexplained weight loss. Not just cancer, but diabetes can be unexplained weight loss. If you have uh, sores that for some reason you scratch your leg one week and two weeks later it still hasn't healed, we need to look at that to make sure that it's, you're not diabetic and make sure that you're, um, you're not getting anything like leukemia or something like that. If you're having blurred vision, or if you have ketones in your urine, which you wouldn't know that unless you went to the doctor and had a um, your urine test done. So the risk factors. Of course, we all, I've already said the um, being overweight and not exercising. If you have a, high, a family history, um, being African American, Hispanic, Asians, and Native Americans, you're at a higher risk for diabetes. 
And of course, it's still at an increased age, you're more likely to get diabetes. And it kind of, it seems to go along with if you have high cholesterol, high blood pressure. And of course, I've already said, if you've had um, diabetes while you were pregnant, you are at a higher risk for diabetes later on. Okay, so the way that it works, so you have your, if you can see the diagram, you have your stomach. Underneath your stomach, you have your pancreas. Your pancreas produces your insulin for your body. What the insulin does is goes and break down when you eat food, um, it breaks down the glucose or your food and breaks it down to glucose. If, you're, if you are no longer producing insulin or your body doesn't respond to the insulin anymore, you have this increase of sugar in your blood that damages your arteries. So you end up um, damaging pretty much most of your body, which I think a lot of people don't realize that it's not just your, they think amputation or a coma or something, but it actually affects your entire body. So the complications, you're going to have heart disease. So if it's messing up your arteries and making them clog up easier, you're going to have heart disease. You'll get nerve damage in your legs. So you'll have this pain that just is probably not going to go away if your sugars are not controlled. And I have to explain to you, it's kind of like a stocking type feeling around your legs. And it starts in your feet and goes up. It's a tingling, numbness, burning type feeling. That, and that's from damage from your diabetes. And of course, everybody knows that it affects your kidneys. Num number one reason most people end up on dialysis is because of diabetes, uncontrolled diabetes. It can cause you to be blind. You can have bad artery disease and you end up having to get your toes, your feet, or your legs amputated. The poor healing, and it can increase your risk of um, not just Alzheimer's, but different types of dementia. So you could start to have problems with your uh, memory. And it increases your chances for cancer. So this is something that you definitely want to get checked. If you are overweight or I usually start checking people around 21. If they come in, I usually do blood work. If I see a child that's overweight, I'm checking them for diabetes. And this is something you definitely want to get checked. So when, your doc when you go into your doctor and they're checking you for diabetes, they're going to do a regular um, electrolyte panel. They're going to look at your glucose. And what they're doing, if you're fasting, which means you haven't eaten, um, since like 12 o'clock at night, uh, and they're gonna look at your level. We look to make sure that it's under 126. If it's over that, then we start to see, okay, well, there could be a problem with that. If it's over 200, you're gonna be on meds. Or if you come into the ER and for some reason, you know, you're dehydrated or you slipped into a coma or something, we find out that your blood sugar is like 400 you're automatically going to either be on insulin or and oral meds. So that's something we definitely want you to at least try to get a check early, because if you get a hold of it early, you don't end up with all of the um, bad side effects, which are the heart disease, the dialysis, the blindness, the amputations. And it, once you do have it, if you keep your sugars under the right amount, you will uh, benefit from that. So the treatment, of course, again, exercise, healthy diet, you have oral medications, and you have insulin. I'm not going to go into all of the different types. Um, that's a whole nother lecture. Okay. So the next one is osteoporosis. And this is where you start to have thinning of your bones. So if you look at the picture, you have your normal bone matrix on the left. And the second one, you see that the holes are a lot bigger. So it makes your bones way more fragile. So you might fall down and end up fracturing something that you normally wouldn't have fractured if your bones were stronger. So the risk factors, if you're over 65, if you're female, this is actually one that if you are of low body weight, you actually have an increased risk of. If you're postmenopause, 
Because when before menopause, your estrogen kind of protects you. Once that's gone, a lot of things just kind of start shutting down. Hate to put it that way. But post-menopause, you're going to have be increased risk of, men of, of osteoporosis. If you're a smoker or if you use a lot of alcohol or heavy alcohol use, if you have a family history, so if you have a grandmama or a mother who you look at and they're bent over like this, you probably have it in your family. So that's your family history. If you have, if you've been on prolonged steroid use, so if you uh, have some type of rheumatoid arthritis or lupus and you're on steroids, you need to be checked for osteoporosis earlier than the recommended 65 years of age. So. As you can see with this woman, which we've seen this everywhere pretty much, you start off tall and then when she gets 65, you're almost a half a foot shorter and your back is curved and you just kind of look kind of fragile. So if you're starting to realize that you're losing height or your stoop posture, you might want to go in and tell your doctor and say, hey, I'm concerned about my height, I might want to get checked. So the way that we check it is just a, we call it a dual energy x-ray abs absorptiometry. So a DEXA scan. All it is is x-ray. So they x-ray your hip and I believe it's your arm. And that from that they give us a um, T-score. And depending on what the score is, we either diagnose you with osteopenia, we say it's regular or it's osteoporosis. If you come up with osteoporosis, we'll start you on medicine and recommend calcium and vitamin D. So you might ask, what is the way to prevent it? So we always say exercising. And a lot of people think that we're saying aerobics is gonna help with your osteoporosis, but it's not really aerobics. It's gonna be your shrimp training. So a lot of us don't really like to go out and pump iron, iron and lift weights and things like that, but that's the type of um, exercising that you need to do to strengthen your bones. So you need to, at least twice a week, lift weights and try to build up your muscle mass. The other thing is calcium, which from between the ages 18 and 50, it's gonna be 1,000 milligrams daily. And if you're over 50, it's 1,200 milligrams daily. And of course, you can always do it through diet, which is milk, yogurt, cheese, things like spinach. Uh, for vitamin D, it's recommended 600 to 800. It's studies out now that they're saying more, but they're not consistent yet. So that's why I didn't recommend the 2,000 and 1,000 yet. Um, and the vitamin D, you get that through sunlight. So if you're fair skinned, you can go out with your arms exposing like your bottom of your legs and stand out in direct sunlight for 10 to 15 minutes. That's enough vitamin D for a day. That's without sunscreen. Now, if you're dark skin, you're gonna have to add about five or 10 minutes onto that to get enough skin for your vitamin D. Or you can do through food. Fish, eggs, milk, cod liver oil. Or you can do it the easy way and just do calcium and vitamin D tablets or I forgot what the little chocolate chews are called. You can, mm-hmm. You can do those over the counter and then you don't have to worry about being out in the sun. And you can wear your um, sunscreen so you don't get skin cancer and all of that. Okay, so we're getting to the last topic, which is the one that I'm more pressed about because it causes everything else, which is uh, being overweight and obese. So in the U.S., it's shown that a third of the adults in the U.S. are obese. Um, for non-Hispanic blacks, it's even higher. So they're saying 50% of us are obese, which is kind of scary. Um, and in the South, it's the highest prevalence. A third of Arkansans are obese. And of course, I already said it's the leading cause of the heart disease, the cancer, the strokes, and the diabetes. So this is a... Um, map, and if you look at the, I think it's pink or red, that's the states that have the highest amount of obesity. So of course Arkansas is in there. Now did everyone get a, a sheet passed out? Let me see. 
Go ahead. You didn't get one. They might have went out. So they didn't get any. I can't find my little helper. Where is she going? She went to go make copies. <laughs> well. <laughs> okay. Um, is her stuff right there? Did anybody get them? Okay. Okay. So I'm trying to see if maybe we can do one per table then. Okay. Well, some people didn't get them. Okay. Sorry. Um, so I'll go ahead. So what I want y'all to do, the ones that do have it, um, look on the back, and we're going to look at our, look up our BMI. So the way that this table works is that you look, you have your height on the side and your weight at the top. So we're going to take, for instance, me. I'm about, I'm right in the middle of 5'5 five, five and 5'6. Five, and I'm 160 pounds. So I am, my BMI is right here. So if you go down, I'm in this little yellow, so I am in the overweight column. So it's good to know what your BMI is and what your goal is. The other thing I like about this is that you can easily go down and figure out what weight you're supposed to be or what your goal weight is. So for me, my goal weight is around between 140 and 150. I'm just 10 pounds away, but it seems like I just can't get there. But <laughs> it's always those last 10 pounds. But so, and on here they, they show the underweight and the severely underweight. And then if you go up, they have the obese and the severely obese. So your levels, the optimal is 18.5 to 24.9. Anything over that is um, gonna, you're gonna get into your overweight. To 30 is overweight, 30 to 40 is obese, and anything over 40 is gonna be severely obese. Okay, so who in here has done a fat diet? Okay. <laughs> I was like, it should be like every hand in there, in here should raise their hand on a fat diet. It, you know, when you look on TV or you hear a friend say, well, all you got to do is drink this right here and you're going to lose like 50 pounds. You got to know it's too good to be true. Even if it did work, look at them three, four months later and tell me if they began to weight back. So, so we got to talk about what's the healthy way to do it. Um, we got, so the first thing, we have to get away from the fad diet. It's not going to be easy to lose the weight. If it's easy, then you're not going to really learn anything from it anyway. At least that's what I have in my head. Um, you have to think about it. Get away from saying, well, I'm on a diet. Just say that you're living healthy. So just change the way that you're eating all together. Don't say, well, I'm going to do this diet for two months, and then I'm going to uh, go on a cruise and eat whatever I want to do. You know, it should be every day you should be doing your food in moderation, and then you can do a little splurging here and there, but it doesn't mean splurge for a whole month and expect to not gain the weight back. So you want to think simple. A lot of diets out there, they say, okay, so you need to be under 1,500 calories a day. You need to eat this many grams of carbs and this many fats, who wants to go there and count up all of that? If you can do it, that's good for you. I tried it, it's not, you know, it's not the best thing to do, especially when you're busy. So you have to think simple. You have to figure out what foods are the good foods you wanna do and make sure that you're eating those. So you need to set achievable goals. And I always have to laugh because I have patients that come in and I'm like, okay, I'm going to see you in a month. Let's go on and set a goal of weight loss. And they were like, well, I'm going to lose 20 pounds. And I'm like, no, you're not. So let's, <laughs> I'm like, don't even kid yourself and come in here and feel sad when those 20 pounds are not even halfway gone. So set achievable goals. So usually I tell them set maybe 
two to five pounds a month. You don't really want to lose it too fast. So maybe one pound a week, if not one pound every two weeks. Moderation is key. And I'm going to go through uh, portion sizes and everything in a second. And we got to get away from, well, I'm just not going to eat today or I'm not going to eat this meal because I'm on a diet. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the truth. We, we've all done it, but that's not the right way to do it. And the way that it's not is because if you sit there and you say, well, I'm only going to eat once a day, what you're doing to your body, because your body is smart, you're making your body go into starvation mode. So every ounce of fat you have is just going to hold it there because they're like, oh, Lord, I'm going into starvation, so I can't burn any of this fat. So that's not really what you want to do. So you want, instead of skipping meals, and it's going to sound crazy, add meals, okay? So you want to do three to five small meals. And this is to keep your metabolism up. So you eat your breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then you might want to have a snack in between that's like an apple and some cheese or some um, crackers and peanut butter, something like that, or just some fruit or veggies with some ranch dip or something. And that's just going to keep your, um, your metabolism up so you can burn off that fat. Um, you have to have a support system. Well, I'm going to say most people need a support system. Some people can just go and say, I'm going to lose this weight, and they have the willpower, and they don't need anybody to kind of help them along. I'm not one of those people. So I have to have at least one other person that's doing it with me to say, when I say, well, I don't feel like doing it today. And they say, well, no, you're going to do it anyway. And if you're doing it with somebody else, make sure that you are that friend. So if you see them looking at a donut, don't let them eat the donut. You know, snatch away or something. It is a support system. Y'all are working together. You're going to succeed. And you succeed better if you're in a group and you're actually doing it together. The other thing, who in here hates to drink water? <laughs> Have y'all tried doing crystal light or anything? Is that more tolerable? Okay, so we've solved that problem. So the recommendation is eight eight ounce glasses a day. Okay, that's about four of those little bottled waters that y'all carry around, okay? Um, that's going to keep you, um, your fluid level through. You're going to flush every, all the bad out, and you're going to keep yourself full. You're not going to be packing yourself in with the sugary drinks that a lot of us like to eat, drink. So while I'm on it, um, let's talk about sodas and juices. And this goes for, if you have kids at home, remember this. If you think about just a regular can of soda, if you look at it every time and think, I'm drinking a sneaker bar, every time you pick one up, that's what you, it's pretty much the same amount of calories and sugar. So if you could easily switch to diet sodas or Coke Zero or the Sprite Zero, which they're not that bad once you get used to them, and are the Crystal Light, because the last thing you want to do is waste your good calories on drinks. Go ahead. Oh, you're, okay. Um, the last thing you want to do is waste your uh, calories or your sugars for the day on a, um, on a soda. For me, I hate to do that. I drink water mainly through the day. I might drink something like a Coke Zero if I'm sleepy. But... Because I, I keep thinking, well, I can, if I don't drink that soda, I might can have a cookie at the end of the day. And then I'm happy and I can go to bed. So it's, you got to get away from those sugary drinks. And that's one of the main things that with little kids we do. We tend to push all this Capri Sun and Kool-Aid and stuff like that into them and juices when that's not the best thing for them to drink. They need to be drinking about the same like us. We need to give them water or the flavored water that's not packed with a lot of sugar. And plus, it kind of makes them a little hyper and leaves the cavities and all that good stuff. The other thing is you need to avoid eating between two to four hours of sleep before you go to sleep. 
So if you're gonna go to sleep around 10, then you need to be eating your dinner around five or six. That's kind of hard, but it is something that it will pay off. Um, the last thing you wanna do is eat and then go straight to sleep, because all of that, you're not gonna have the metabolism to burn it off before you lay down. So it's just gonna all go into fat. So that's why they tell you don't go to sleep uh, right after you eat. Okay, so portion, <laughs> portion distortion. Okay, so the way it is going, they used to have the correct portions when you go to the fast food restaurants and the restaurants, but now it's like they're going to meet demand, so they're making these huge, uh, they give you all this food, and then we, what we do, we sit there and just say, well, we got the food, we might as well eat it all, when really you got to eat like probably half of it. So a big part of eating a healthy diet is knowing the amount that you need to stop at. So if you look at this picture, this is kind of like a, a regular value meal from McDonald's. So you have a regular hamburger, fries, and a whole bunch of ketchup. But then when you look on the other one, the actual one serving is about half of those french fries and a half of the hamburger. So, of course, this is a little bit hard to do, but sometimes you might think, well, maybe it might sound weird, but maybe you should get like a Happy Meal. Okay. So, I'm going to wrap it up because we're out of time. I actually made it an hour. Look at this. So, I want y'all to look at this. I want y'all to learn how to... Um, Divide your plates, half of it should be vegetables, a uh, fourth of it should be starch, and a fourth should be your meat. So, I'm gonna skip that. So you already said you wanna limit your salt to 1,523 milligrams per day, which is about one teaspoon of salt. Uh, to do that, you wanna offer fresh or frozen vegetables. You wanna avoid processed or prepackaged foods like your uh, TV dinners. You wanna cut back on salty snacks like chips, pretzels, and uh, slowly reduce the salt in your diet so you won't miss it so much. And as far as the exercise, I wanna bring this in before y'all have a thing this afternoon. The recommended thing is 150 minutes per week of moderate exercise, which is brisk walking, or, or a combination with 75 minutes per week of vigorous exercise, which is jogging or running. So that um, turns out to be about 30 minutes a day for five days a week. And you can divide that into the 10 or 15 minutes a day if you need to, if you can't get to that 30 minutes. So you can do 10 minutes in the morning and uh, 20 minutes in the evening, however you need to split it up. But long as you get to the 150 minutes a week. And lastly, the muscle strengthening, you need to do that about two times a week. Okay. Thank y'all. On behalf of Black and Gold Pit and Bowl, we would like to give you this award. Thank you. Okay, and thank you for coming and sharing with us. Okay. Let's give her another hand.